Hi, my name is Derek Bros. For the last eight years, I've worked as a freelance investigative journalist based in Houston, Texas. Since 2012, I've covered a wide range of topics from indigenous resistance at Standing Rock to corporate and government surveillance to covering important trials like Chelsea Manning's sentencing and the Silk Road trial. Throughout this time, I've realized that choosing to investigate certain topics will often get you labeled as a conspiracy theorist, or at the very least, a proponent of less than credible journalism, aka fake news. One of these forbidden topics relates to the potential harm caused by cell phones and other digital technology. Over the years, I've seen articles discussing the dangers of radio frequency radiation and electromagnetic fields. Again, I noticed that these studies never made the mainstream headlines or the 24-hour cable news cycle. And even if the news had reported on this information, would it have made a difference? I, like millions of other people around the world, never gave a second thought that cell phones and laptops could be causing harm to human health. We assume that the government agencies responsible for testing these fields have tested everything for safety. I started to wonder, has this blind faith in authority been a huge mistake? My ignorance on these topics came to an end in September 2018 when I learned that the city of Houston had recently partnered with Microsoft and Verizon to turn Houston into a smart city. This smart city would use emerging 5G technology to power the so-called Internet of Things, which in turn will allow for driverless vehicles, robot assistance, artificial intelligence, sensors in the street to moderate street lights and environmental warning systems, and many other futuristic technologies that we have been promised. And at this time, I had very little understanding of what exactly 5G was, but my preliminary research had shown me that there were an increasing amount of people asking questions about the health and privacy concerns. I also learned that there were lawsuits taking place across Texas and around the world as the opposition to 5G pushed back against the federal government and the wireless industry seizing power from towns, cities, and states. On October 1st, 2018, Houston Mayor Sylvester Turner held a press conference with officials from Verizon Wireless. The mayor and Verizon CEO Hans Vestberg were on location at a Houston couple's home as they installed 5G equipment and helped the young couple become the world's first 5G customer. At this event, Mayor Turner and Mr. Vestberg were both questioned about the health and privacy concerns which have been raised by scientists, doctors, journalists, activists, and security experts. Both Turner and Vestberg told me that they were not aware of any health or privacy concerns. We are the first city for the installation of 5G anywhere in the, in the world. It's just another, it's, it's just another bragging right. Okay, New York can't say it, LA can't, Chicago, Philadelphia, Atlanta, DC, but we can say it in the city. Mayor Turner, as far as moving forward with innovation and, like you said, wanting to be the first, has anybody stopped to look at uh, any studies related to potential health effects of increasing the amount of small cells in the city, as well as privacy concerns that the American Civil Liberties Union and others have put out concerns regarding the push towards smart cities? Any thoughts on that? You know, I haven't seen any recent studies on it. I mean, the reality is, is that um, um, if you want to move things quicker, if you want to innovate, you're going to, the installation, the, I mean, the infrastructure is critically important. Is there any concern about uh, the health effects of the increase in health and small cells? The studies that have been done over years has, ne has not shown any effects or, or health effects on the radio signals and there's no difference. There are, there are safety rules on all of it uh, that is uh, regulated by the regulator, how much power, how power, power I was not do. satisfied with their answers to say the least. I did more research and the following week I attended Houston City Council to share what I had found with the mayor and the council. Hello members of City Council, how are you doing? Hope everybody's doing well today. Uh, some of you know who I am. For those who are unfamiliar, I'll just introduce myself briefly. My name is Derek Bros. I'm a journalist here in the city of Houston. I work for KPFT 90.1. I have a radio show Monday afternoons, and I work for the local news as well. I've emailed each of you, including the mayor, the last three, week in, three weeks in a row, including this morning, related to the implementation of 5G technology here in the city. I'm hoping those didn't go to your spam folders and maybe somebody saw them. But if not, please do check your spam folders. I sent one this morning. And last week, I was able to talk to the mayor a little bit at the unveiling of the world's first 5G customer here in the city of Houston. And the mayor expressed a desire to move forward, that the city wants to be number one. We want to be number one before New York, before Austin, before all these kinds of things. A lot of pride in moving the city forward with the implementation of 5G and all that it might bring, all the new technologies. However... What I've been sending to you guys in emails is the fact that there are a number of privacy and health concerns related to the rollout of 5G technology. This visit to council was followed by another. Just going to touch base on where we left off 
I think two weeks now, I was talking to you guys about the 5G technology rollout. And another. There are many people asking questions, including scientists, doctors, researchers. And another. I attended the Houston Tower Commission meeting yesterday where there was an appeal for a 5G tower that is going up in the Third Ward where uh, members of Third Ward have put together a petition trying to stop this tower because it's 35 feet away from someone's home. We've also talked with members of uh, Tanglewood who have come here and spoken out about uh, towers near elementary schools. We've talked with folks from Sharpstown to Acres Home, Montrose, all over the city who are concerned about the placement of the towers, some for aesthetic reasons, some for uh, health reasons, others just generally... You know, not sure they want them in their neighborhoods. Thank you. Derek, thank you for showing up today because uh, this is something that does need to have a light shine upon it. Um, These videos gained more than 900,000 views on YouTube alone, leading activists from around the world to reach out to me and encourage me to keep going. And I'm really concerned, I think, with what it's, you know, the people talking about the schools today are worried about the mayor and city council's close connection to certain industries and certain groups and how that might influence an issue. And I I really, Mayor, after all this time of asking you face-to-face and asking the head of Verizon, the fact that you got awarded the 5G Wireless Champion Award in September 2018, I would hate to believe that that has anything to do with why you won't respond to any questions about 5G, why you haven't dis, you know discussed the safety or lack of safety related to small cells, and why Houston is just marching forward, partnered with Verizon to implement 5G without giving the people of the city any, anything. You know, you're not offering us anything. Can you say conclusively that it's safe? Can you say conclusively that we will still have privacy once 5G goes live? Or are you just concerned with being the first and making sure we have driverless cars and all these different things that you've talked about in interviews? Again, you were awarded the 5G wireless champion, so I would expect you to know something about what you were being given an award for and uh, just invite each of you to check your emails, check your phone calls, because people are emailing you, people are contacting you, um, and we need, we need something from you guys. Otherwise, um, at least I just want to make sure that I keep coming here and putting it on record that you guys are ignoring the questions that people have. And in the future, if there are lawsuits for people getting cancer, getting illnesses, or other concerns, you guys will be held accountable. Your time has expired. Thank, thank you. And I do support 5G. Thank you. Do you have anything to say about the safety, Council, the health aspects of it, Council, Mayor? Councilmember Christie. I was also featured on local news discussing the concerns around the 5G rollout. I confronted the mayor of Houston for his close ties to the wireless industry and ignoring the concerns about 5G. The mayor ran away from my questions at city council and on three different occasions in public. How you doing, mayor? Hey, man. When are we going to sit down? When are we going to get to sit and talk down? You know I want to ask you a real... You know, I already know what you want to ask me. Well, come on, then. Then, then answer it. You know the question. You want to ask me about 5G. Because you're the 5G wireless champion. Come on. Isn't that what they gave you? The award? The CTIA? The cellular industry gave you the 5G wireless champion award? And then you won't even answer any questions at city council. It's so funny. The people of Houston are concerned about privacy and health, and you're the 5G wireless champion, and you won't even listen to them. It's hilarious. Don't touch me, sir. Don't touch me. It's hilarious, Mayor. Mayor Turner. I'll see you at city council. You can keep laughing. People of Houston are paying attention. Don't touch my equipment. No, they ignore me at city council. That's the problem. That's why I'm running. Due to the response from the mayor and the city, I ran a campaign for mayor of Houston calling for a moratorium on the installation of any more 5G towers until further studies are conducted. I'd like to give Houstonians a voice on a number of other issues that are not typically discussed in Houston. This includes police surveillance, the current 5G rollout, which is highly controversial to many Houstonians. As well Over as the last year, my research has involved interviewing health and privacy experts and uncovering the truth about the race to 5G. What I have learned is that the industry known as Big Wireless is colluding with the Federal Communications Commission to create a false demand for 5G in total disregard for the health and privacy concerns, and all the while using the rollout to strip away local power. I offer the conclusions of my research and the hopes that the public will question and oppose the promises of the 5G Trojan horse. Chapter 1 Understanding the Electromagnetic Spectrum To have a discussion on 5G, we first have to talk about electromagnetic frequencies, or EMFs. An EMF is the measure of how many times the peak of a wave passes a particular point per second, and it's measured in hertz. This range of potential frequencies makes up what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum is divided into separate bands, and the electromagnetic waves within each frequency band are called by different names, including radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, 
X-rays, and gamma rays at the high frequency end. Within those bands, gamma rays, X-rays, and high ultraviolet are classified as ionizing radiation, meaning they have sufficient energy to ionize atoms, causing chemical reactions. Exposure to these rays can be a health hazard, causing radiation sickness, DNA damage, and cancer. Radiation from visible light and lower wavelength are called non-ionizing radiation because they apparently cannot cause these effects. What is 5G? Devices like cell phones, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth all operate on the microwave's band of the electromagnetic spectrum. Microwaves are also used in mobile phones, and certain wavelengths are absorbed strongly by water molecules and so are used to cook food. These are not the wavelengths, however, that are used in mobile phones. Microwaves are used in Doppler radar, which is widely used for short-term localized weather forecasting and what you see on TV weather news. When it comes to cell phones, a new generation of cellular standards has appeared approximately every 10 years since 1G systems were first introduced in 1979. Each new generation is characterized by new frequency bands, higher data rates, and non-backwards compatible transmission technology. The second generation, or 2G, featured cell phones with texting and pictures. The third generation came about around 2000 with the introduction of phones with some internet, video, and images. The fourth generation came around 2009 with the introduction of smartphones and instant streaming of video, as well as the use of apps. As we move into 2020, the shift to the fifth generation, or 5G, has already begun. In addition to being promoted as the solution to 4K movie downloads, the new technology is expected to herald the beginning of smart cities, where driverless cars, traffic lights, pollution sensors, smartphones, and countless other smart devices interact in what is known as the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things, or IoT, is a fancy way to say that we will be surrounded by hundreds of thousands of interconnected devices and sensors which are gathering mass amounts of data that will be used to show you advertising, monitor your habits, and other uses that we can't even predict yet. The switch from 4G to 5G is a change unlike those of previous generations. One notable difference is that 5G technology uses much higher frequencies ranging from 10 to 300 gigahertz. 5G is using millimeter waves, which are easily blocked and do not travel far. The 5G rollout means the installation of hundreds of thousands of new cell sites, towers, and additions to existing infrastructure. Cities like Houston, Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, Denver, San Diego, New York, and Washington, D.C. have already begun to deploy 5G for residential and commercial uses. Let's take a moment to examine some of the concerns around 5G and EMFs in general. Chapter 2 the concerns around EMFs and 5G. Over the years, I've come across articles claiming that cell phones were giving people cancer or making them sick. I didn't pay too much attention at first, but when I finally decided to investigate the topic, I realized that there is ample evidence that the technology we are so hurriedly surrounding ourselves with might be putting our lives at risk in more ways than one. I started by trying to understand the concerns around EMFs. I went through hundreds of studies, including those funded by government sources and those funded independently. I came across studies discussing extremely low frequency electromagnetic fields and their effect on DNA. The researchers concluded that cells exposed to extremely low frequencies, or ELFs, quote, presented an increase of the number of cells with high damaged DNA as compared with non-exposed cells. I found studies examining a potential association between nocturnal mobile phone use and mental health, suicidal feelings, and self-injury in adolescents. I also found an interesting study discussing the excitability of the brain being induced by radio frequencies. The study stated that, quote, these results suggest that low-intensity radio frequency fields can modulate the excitability of hippocampal tissue in vitro in the absence of gross thermal effects. The changes in excitability may be consistent with reported behavioral effects of radio frequency fields. A 2004 study found, quote, an increased risk of acoustic neuroma tumors associated with mobile phone use of at least 10 years duration. I also found studies that were inconclusive, like this one, which found, quote, no conclusive evidence of an association between the mobile and cordless phone and a meningioma brain tumor. The study discovered a, quote, indication of increased risk, but was not, quote, supported by statistically significant increasing risk, ultimately calling for further studies. A study by Kaiser Permanente examined rates of miscarriages for women near cell towers. The study of hundreds of pregnant women in the San Francisco area 
found that those who were more exposed to the type of radiation produced by cell phones, wireless networks, and power lines, radiation that grows more common every day, were nearly three times as likely to miscarry. The Kaiser Permanente study did not show definitively what was causing the higher rate of pregnancy loss, nor did it isolate the potential impact of cell phones or other producers of EMFs. However, the authors said the results underscored the need for more research into the potential dangers. During my investigation, I came across the name of Dr. Martin Paul, a professor emeritus of biochemistry and basic medical sciences at Washington State University. Dr. Paul is a published and widely cited scientist on the biological effects of electromagnetic fields, an expert in how wireless radiation impacts the electrical systems of our bodies. He has published seven studies showing there exists sensitivity to electromagnetic fields and what is known as the voltage sensor in each cell of the body. A study by Paul found this sensitivity in response to Wi-Fi. He calls this effect an important threat to human health. According to Dr. Paul, there are at least 15 different ways EMFs harm humans, including changes in brain structure and function, changes in various types of psychological responses and changes in behavior, at least eight different endocrine hormonal effects, cardiac effects influencing the electrical control of the heart, chromosome breaks and other changes in chromosome structure, histological changes in the testes, cell death, lowered male fertility, including lowered sperm quality and function, and also lowered female fertility, cellular DNA damage, including single-strand breaks and double-strand breaks in cellular DNA, cancer, which is likely to involve these DNA changes, but also increased rates of tumor promotion-like events, cataract formation, breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, melatonin depletion, and sleep disruption. In 2016, Dr. Paul released another study on EMFs in the Journal of Chemical Neuroanatomy. 18 more recent epidemiological studies provide substantial evidence that microwave EMFs from cell mobile phone stations, excessive cell mobile phone usage, and from wireless smart meters can produce similar patterns of neuropsychiatric effects. Lesser evidence from six additional studies suggests that shortwave, radio station, occupational, and digital TV antenna exposures may produce similar neuropsychiatric effects. Among the more commonly reported changes are sleep disturbance, insomnia, headache, depression, depressive symptoms, fatigue, tiredness, concentration, attention dysfunction, memory changes, dizziness, irritability, loss of appetite, restlessness and anxiety, nausea, skin burning or tingling, and EEG changes. He concluded that, quote, extensive epidemiological studies performed over the past 50 years all collectively show that various non-thermal microwave EMF exposures produce diverse neuropsychiatric effects. Dr. Paul also notes that the effects of EMFs were documented 49 years ago in the U.S. Office of Naval Medical Research Report published in 1971. Despite the breadth of his work, Dr. Martin Paul has largely been pushed to the fringes of society. To be fair, there are scientists who accuse him of bias and cherry-picking evidence to make his claims. In 2018, I asked Dr. Martin Paul why his work has been either ignored or pushed out of the mainstream conversation. We quit funding, we quit, uh, funding the studies of this sort back between 1986 and 1999. We've done almost nothing since then. So, so basically, uh, the U.S. government's been pushing this, these technologies, at the same time doing absolutely nothing, or almost absolutely nothing, to protect us. The debate around the safety of cell phones and other devices that emit EMFs grew a little more heated in early November 2018 when the National Toxicology Program released data concluding that there is clear evidence that radiofrequency radiation can cause brain and heart tumors and male lab rats. The $30 million study took more than 10 years to complete as researchers examined the effects of prolonged exposure to high levels of radiofrequency radiation, specifically the type of radiation emitted via 2G and 3G cellular networks. The researchers write, quote, There was also some evidence of tumors in the brain and adrenal gland of exposed male rats. For female rats and male-female mice, the evidence was equivocal as to whether cancers observed were associated with exposures to radiofrequency radiation. The NTP cautions that the results should not be applied to humans, and the FDA and other government agencies have also said that they do not support the conclusions and they do not apply to 5G. The exposures used in the studies cannot be compared directly to the exposure that humans experience when using a cell phone. In our studies, rats and mice received radiofrequency radiation across their whole bodies. The NTP stated, quote, 
the lowest exposure level used in the studies was equal to the maximum local tissue exposure currently allowed for cell phone users. A major development from California's Department of Public Health, high use of cell phones may be linked to certain types of cancer and other health effects, including brain cancer and tumors, lower sperm counts, headaches, and effects on learning, memory, hearing, behavior, and sleep. The final report notes that it represents the consensus of the NTP and a panel of external scientific experts. I think the most important study is a study by the National Toxicology Program in a classic large carcinogenicity test, one of the largest ever performed, and for that matter, one of the most expensive, they found increased risk of the tumors, which we believe radiofrequency radiation is causing in man. Uh, particular tumors called schwannomas, in the rats they were in the heart, in, in humans they're often in the nerve, the ear nerve, the vestibular nerve. In a health advisory, the NTP recommends those concerned about the potential health risks from RFR should, quote, use speaker mode or a headset to place more distance between your head and the cell phone, or reduce the amount of time spent using your cell phone. The NTP seems to suggest that the only way to avoid the health concerns is to avoid using a cell phone. Ronald Melnick, a researcher and scientist who designed the exposure systems used in the study, disagrees with the FDA and the FCC. Dr. Shuren neglects to note that the International Agency for Research on Cancer, as part of the World Health Organization, classified radiofrequency radiation from wireless devices as a possible human carcinogen, based largely on findings of increased risks of gliomas and Schwann cell tumors in the brain near the ear in humans after long-term use of cell phones. The IARC designation of cell phones as a possible carcinogen has been highly controversial since it was first issued in 2011. In an opinion piece published by The Hill, Melnick stated that, quote, simply claiming that conclusions about human risk cannot be drawn from animal studies runs counter to standard practices of evaluating human cancer risks by public health agencies, including the U.S. EPA, NTP, IARC, and even the FDA. Every chemical known to cause cancer in humans is also carcinogenic in animals when adequately tested. In an interview with Josh Del Sol of Take Back Your Power, Dr. Melnick elaborated on the problems he sees with the U.S. regulatory agencies. Approximately $30 million was invested to see if, if cell phones cause cancer um, at levels at or below the allowable levels, right, in, in, in mm -hmm. rats. And mm -hmm. the answer is that there was a significant increase in schwannomas of the heart and gliomas in the brain, and then they dropped... They just dropped it. So, I mean, uh, I guess I want to ask the question, like, um, why do you think? Now, we're, we're getting into speculation here, and we know that Harvard, you know, ethics department has written about the FCC's, um, you know, being controlled by industry. But the FDA, we've heard in, in other conversations various things about them. But, like, what's actually going on and how significant of a thing is this, Ron, that the study was done, it showed cancer, and then they just dropped it? How, what's, help us to frame this here. Well, I, I can't tell you why they decided as such. Uh, all I can say is that they decided at this point or as far as I know, not to do anything about this. This information was actually available in 2016 when the NTP released some of the partial findings because of the potential impact of these findings on the general population. Uh, the tumors in the heart and tumors in the brain were known in 2016. Uh, you know, it could be that they don't want people to think that their cell phones pose a cancer hazard. Uh, maybe they have other reasons, and I, I can't say whether or not uh, the industry is having an influence. That is certainly a possibility. Uh, but it seems to me that from a public health perspective, what you'd want to do is understand the risk quantify it and do something about it. Promote precautionary principles. Even more recently, an August 2019 investigation by the Chicago Tribune 
found that currently available models of cell phones are already exceeding the safety limits set by the FCC. This means that the cell phones being used by millions of Americans are exposing them to dangerous levels of radiation. There is clearly sufficient evidence to warrant a mass warning to consumers of electronic devices, yet we are met with silence from health professionals and mainstream corporate media. But what about the health concerns around 5G? 5G is an emerging technology that hasn't really been defined yet. From what we currently understand, it likely differs dramatically from what we studied. Consequently, I believe that new wireless technologies, including 5G, should be adequately tested before their implementation leads to unacceptable levels of human exposures and increased health risks. Additionally, hundreds of scientists from around the world have signed the so-called 5G appeal, a statement calling on a global moratorium on 5G. We, the undersigned scientists and doctors, recommend a moratorium on the rollout of the fifth generation 5G for telecommunication until potential hazards for human health and the environment have been fully investigated by scientists independent from industry. 5G will substantially increase exposure to radio frequency electromagnetic fields on top of the 2G, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, etc. for telecommunications already in place. Radio frequency electromagnetic fields has been proven to be harmful for humans and the environment. At a May 2018 United Nations hearing, Claire Edwards warned the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres about the dangers of 5G. Edwards is a co-organizer of a second appeal to stop 5G called the International Appeal to Stop 5G on Earth and in Space, which as of December 2019 had 186,352 signatories from 208 nations and territories. At the hearing, she told Guterres that recently installed Wi-Fi equipment could cause harm to UN employees. Since December 2015, the staff here at the Vienna International Center have been exposed to off-the-scale electromagnetic radiation from Wi-Fi and mobile phone boosters installed on very low ceilings throughout the buildings. Current public exposure levels are at least one quintillion, that's 18 zeros, one quintillion times above natural background radiation, according to Professor Ole Johansson of the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. The highly dangerous biological effects of EMFs have been documented by thousands of studies since 1932, indicating that we may be facing a global health catastrophe orders of magnitude worse than those caused by tobacco and cigarettes. Mr. Secretary-General, on the basis of the precautionary principle, I urge you to have these EMF-emitting devices removed immediately from these buildings and to call a halt to any rollout of 5G at UN duty stations because 5G is designed to deliver concentrated and focused electromagnetic radiation in excess of 100 times current levels in the same way as do directed energy weapons. In line with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights to protect, respect and remedy, 5G technologies must be subjected to an independent health and safety assessment before they are launched anywhere in the world. There is currently an international appeal signed by 237 EMF scientists from 41 nations urging the UN and particularly the WHO to exert strong leadership in fostering the development of more protective EMF guidelines, encouraging precautionary measures and educating the public about the considerable health risks. Guterres claimed he was ignorant to the dangers of the technology. Sorry, because uh, we are talking with someone that is a little bit ignorant on these things. You are talking to the Wi-Fi systems? Um, on the ceilings of these buildings, uh, Wi-Fi boosters and cell phone boosters were installed without consultation, without information to staff in December 2015. The situation here is extremely dangerous. I have heard anecdotally of many people who have had health problems. I don't know if they are related, but the precautionary principle would di dictate that we use our medical records to look into this and that we remove these dangerous devices immediately. Thank you. Well, I become worried because I put those devices in my house. <laughs> so. Not a good idea. So, uh, uh, I, this I will have to, I mean, I confess my ignorance on this, 
uh, we will have to, uh, I, I'm go, but I'm going to raise this with WHO, which I think is the organization that might be able to deal with it properly, for them to, um, I mean, put someone, uh, their staff or organizations to work on that, because I must confess, I was not aware of that danger. To the extent that I've put those things in the rooms of my house, in the ceiling. Groups like Physicians for Safe Technology have also called for caution and common sense on 5G. Doctors have begun speaking out about the concerns of surrounding ourselves with hundreds of thousands of new cell towers and small cells in the interest of 5G. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I'm Sharon Goldberg. I'm an internal medicine physician. I've practiced medicine for 21 years, and my background is mostly academic, internal medicine, hospital-based, clinical research, and medical education. Um, I am going to skip many of the things I wanted to say because I didn't realize it was only five minutes. Wireless radiation has biological effects, period. This is no longer a subject for debate when you look at PubMed and the peer-reviewed literature. These effects are seen in all life forms, plants, animals, insects, microbes. In humans, we have clear evidence of cancer now. There is no question. Um, we have evidence of DNA damage, cardiomyopathy, which is the precursor of congestive heart failure, neuropsychiatric effects. So 5G is not a conversation about whether or not these biological effects exist. They clearly do. 5G is a conversation about unsustainable healthcare expenditures. Why do I say this? We've been sitting on the evidence for EMR and chronic disease for decades. Um, and now we are seeing all these epidemics appearing. So diabetes is the first epidemic. I think most of you know the statistics. They're very scary. One in three American children will become diabetic in their lifetime, and if they're Hispanic females, the number is one in two. Okay. So what does this have to do with wireless radiation? Wireless radiation and other electromagnetic fields, such as magnetic fields and dirty electricity, have been clearly associated with elevated blood sugar and diabetes. That is what the peer-reviewed literature says. It is not opinion. The closer you live to a cell tower, the higher your blood glucose. That is based on hemoglobin A1C measurements. So the idea with small cells of putting the cells closer to people's homes and bedrooms scientifically is very dangerous. Thus far, there have only been a few politicians brave enough to speak out about this issue. Former Michigan State Senator Patrick Kolbeck recently spoke out against the unprecedented rollout of this new untested technology. All of us know in our hearts we would not knowingly move our family, move our home next to a cell tower, right? We know it implicitly that there's something just not right there. The fact is that there have been studies talking about cell phone usage and this is $20 million study by, um, by the federal government because they wanted to make sure absolutely beyond a reasonable doubt that they knew exactly what was happening with cell phone uh, technology and cell phone usage. They found and they determined conclusively that there were carcinogenic effects. Um, now, now we're talking about what's going on with the 5G system. Just want to make sure everybody understands. The issue with 5G wireless deployment um, is not the convenience, because we all like the convenience. It's not the uh, ease of deployment, because it's a lot easier just to pop something up on a tree than it is to actually bury it under the ground and route it to somebody's house in a hardware configuration. The issue is that 5G deployment, because it operates in a higher frequency band of 24 to 90 gigahertz, has to use a higher power density level to get through walls and get through solid objects. And that means you're going to have to put these things every 2 to 10 homes. So you're going to have a cell tower every 2 to 10 homes. Nobody would move next to a cell tower, right? So this is something that is a serious concern. And once again, remember that denial of request or denial permit request that you can put in? It's going to point back to the acceptable levels as determined by the FCC. Not the EPA and not the CDC, the ones who usually take care of health concerns, but by the FCC, which is staffed by former F, um, members of the telecommunication industry. That's the fox guarding the hen house. In April 2019, New York Congressman Thomas Suzy sent a letter to the FCC seeking answers about the technology. Suzy wrote, quote, Small cell towers are being installed in residential neighborhoods in close proximity to houses throughout my district. I have heard instances of these antennas being installed on light poles directly outside the window of a young child's bedroom. 
Rightly so, my constituents are worried that should this technology be proven hazardous in the future, the health of their families and value of their properties would be at serious risk. New Jersey Congressman Andy Kim also sent a letter noting that, quote, current regulations governing radio frequency safety were put in place in 1996 and have not been reassessed for newer generation technologies. Despite the close proximity to sensitive areas where these high band cells will be installed, little research has been conducted to examine 5G safety. Most disturbing of all, Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut exposed that big wireless and the FCC have failed to do adequate independent studies into the effects of emerging 5G technology. At a Senate Commerce Committee hearing, Blumenthal questioned industry representatives about the absence of this research. In December of 2018, I sent a letter to FCC Commissioner Carr asking him to cite for me recent scientific studies demonstrating the safety of this technology. What research has been done, where has it been published, and compiled. He has essentially failed to do so and just echoed the general statements of the FDA, which shares regulatory responsibility for cell phones with the FCC. If you go to the FDA website, pretty unsatisfactory. Uh, There basically uh, is a cursory and superficial citation to existing scientific data saying, quote, the FDA has urged the cell phone industry to take a number of steps, including support additional research on possible biological effects of radio frequency fields for the type of signal emitted by cell phones. Uh, I believe that Americans deserve to know what the health effects are. My question for, for you, particularly Mr. Gillen and Mr. Perry, um, how much money has the industry committed to supporting additional independent research? I stress independent research. Is that independent research ongoing? Has any been completed? Where can consumers look for it? Um, and we're talking about research on the biological effects of this new technology. Thank you, Senator. I, I think, uh, thank you for your focus on the issue. Uh, safety is paramount, and as you alluded to, we rely on the expert agencies. We rely on the findings of the FDA and others as to the requirements to keep all of us safe. Uh, there are no industry back studies, to my knowledge right now. Happy to visit with you as to what Uh, opportunities you think there needs to be more studies and we're always for more science. We also rely on what the scientists tell us. At the end of the exchange, Blumenthal concluded, So there really is no research ongoing. We're kind of flying blind here so far as health and safety is concerned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As more health professionals, politicians, and scientists speak out against the dangers of 5G and EMFs, the cellular industry and some in the mainstream media have begun pushing back. In March 2019, William Broad of the New York Times wrote a piece promoting the idea that those who are concerned about the health effects of 5G are simply falling prey to Russian propaganda designed to make America lose the race to 5G. His article, Your 5G Phone Won't Hurt You, But Russia Wants You to Think Otherwise, sought to place the blame for concern around 5G on the shoulders of America's favorite boogeymen, the Russians. Interestingly, Broad failed to mention that in April 2019, the Times announced a partnership with Verizon to showcase a 5G journalism lab. This seems to be a new trend for corporate media, as the Washington Post announced a similar deal with AT&T in November 2019. Questions regarding potential conflicts of interest have not been addressed. By relegating concerns about 5G to a Russian ploy, he misses altogether the fact that the purportedly independent international authorities on which he relies that declare 5G to be safe are an exclusive club of industry-loyal scientists. China, Russia, Poland, Italy, and several other European countries allow up to hundreds of times less wireless radiation into the environment from microwave antennas than does the U.S. Davis went even further comparing the treatment of those who raise awareness about the public impact of radio frequency microwave radiation to that of those scientists in the 1950s and 60s who attempted to ring alarm bells about the dangers of tobacco. Scientists who showed the harmful effects of tobacco 
found themselves struggling for serious attention and financial support. She continued, For health impacts from wireless radiation, a similar pattern is emerging. Each time a U.S. government agency produced positive findings, research on health impacts was defunded. The Office of Naval Research, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and the Environmental Protection Agency all once had vibrant research programs documenting dangers of wireless radiation. All found their programs scrapped, reflecting pressure from those who sought to suppress their work. Ironically, one of the sources for an extensive amount of research on the health effects of EMFs comes from Russia and Ukraine. In epidemiological studies of the population of Ukraine, a connection was established between leukemia in children and cancer in adults and exposure to EMFs at industrial frequencies. Specific injuries under radio wave exposure are development of cataracts, instability and leukocyte makeup of peripheral blood, and vegetovascular disorder. Additionally, on March 3, 2011, the members of the Russian National Committee on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection approved a resolution on the effects of non-ionizing radiation emitted by cell phones. According to U.S. government agencies, cell phones and EMFs are non-ionizing, meaning they do not have the power to alter atoms in the human body. Because of this, and the assumption that heating alone cannot cause health problems, the public is told that non-ionizing means safe. The resolution by the committee says otherwise. The committee states that, quote, Urgent measures must be taken because of the inability of children to recognize the harm from the mobile phone use and that a mobile phone itself can be considered as an uncontrolled source of harmful exposure. The committee called for requiring health information regarding exposure to EMFs on the phone itself, as well as setting limits for children and teens using cell phones and laptops. As of 2019, no U.S. regulatory body has adopted similar measures. Regarding this debate around ionizing and non-ionizing radiation, I asked Dr. Martin Paul why some researchers claim that non-ionizing radiation is safe and others claim that it causes harm. When you're thinking about radiation, you're talking about the individual photons that make it up. And the fact is that the individual photons uh, that make up non-ionizing radiation, particularly you know, in the microwave and uh, lower frequency uh, ranges, uh, don't have enough energy to influence the chemistry of our bodies. That's true. They don't. But we're not talking about the individual photons. It's the fields as a whole. And those fields as a whole put forces on, uh, on a structure called the voltage sensor that controls these uh, voltage-gated calcium channels. And that structure is extraordinarily sensitive to these, to these fields. And that's why you get activation of the, of the uh, voltage-gated calcium channels and why you get excessive calcium in the cell. So we know why the system works. We know why it's so extraordinarily sensitive. And and the industry has been claiming that these uh, fields are not strong enough to do anything. But the reason the industry is wrong is because this structure is extraordinarily sensitive to the forces of the EMF. So this comes straight out of the physics, and this is is where the physics background uh, that I have has been, been very valuable in addition to understanding the biology. Despite the attacks from mainstream news and promises from big wireless, there are a great deal of reasons to be concerned about health issues related to cell phones, laptops, smart devices, and 5G. Now, to be fair, there are, of course, scientists and researchers who say that the claims of health problems associated with EMFs are exaggerated and unfounded. The proponents of EMFs claim that the opposition is cherry-picking evidence to make their case. However, even if one takes only a cursory look at what we have just shown to you, it should be easy enough to see that rolling out a new, untested technology is not smart science. At the very least, we must encourage public officials to exercise the precautionary principle and do further testing before rolling out 5G. Smart City or Surveillance City Cancer and other health issues are not the only concerns being raised by the critics of 5G and the Internet of Things. There are also a growing number of professionals, government agencies, civil rights attorneys, and activists who are raising important questions about the digital future. In April 2018, the American Civil Liberties Union released a guide detailing important questions that should be asked by city officials seeking to join the smart city evolution. When we talk about smart city technology, 
or the Internet of Things in the, in the government context, that what we're really talking about is you know, electronics that are maybe small and, and, and cheap that can be placed around the city and that essentially can be designed to collect information, whether it's visual information or audio information or information about, say, whether a parking space is occupied. But before any smart city technology is acquired or deployed, it's really important that a city working with its community determine whether uh, that technology is actually smart for the city to do. Why do, we ask, why do we say that? Well, that's because, you know, smart city technology can be a wolf in sheep's clothing. It can be another way for uh, the government to amass information that it may not have wanted to collect for law enforcement purposes, but that might be vulnerable to that sort of use later, or that they may not have wanted to collect for immigration purposes, but that could potentially be vulnerable to that later. And again, this technology is often going to be collected by technologies that, that, that companies uh, have developed. And so it's really important for the city and the community to be on the same page about who's going to own this data if we go forward with this project, who's going to be able to sell this data, and at the end of the day, are communities in control of these technologies. There already exist a few examples of what a smart city will resemble, including in South Korea. They envision sporting venues using 5G hot zones to deliver personalized video feeds of a customer's favorite player to their mobile device or allow healthcare providers to test assisted surgery with augmented and virtual reality. Other use cases for the smart city technology include CCTV, traffic control, and smart lighting, where environmentally friendly lights automatically turn off when no one is nearby. Noticeably missing from this endorsement of Samsung's privacy list city is the fact that these CCTV cameras and devices are recording 24 hours a day and are capable of notifying law enforcement if someone jaywalks, speeds, or whatever other behavior the Crown has deemed illegal. Let's look at another example of a smart city. Keyside is a planned smart city that has been in the works since 2016. Located on 12 acres of waterfront property southeast of downtown Toronto, Canada, Keyside represents a joint effort by the Canadian government agency Waterfront Toronto and Sidewalk Labs, which is owned by Google's parent company, Alphabet Inc., Sidewalk Labs claims Keyside will solve traffic congestion, rising home prices, and environmental pollution. There are even plans for housing developments and a school within the smart city. Unfortunately, residents of Keyside will be using a centralized identity management system through which they will access public services such as library cards and healthcare. This means their data will be highly centralized, leaving it open to access by hackers and law enforcement. However, Keyside has consistently faced pushback due to a failure to build in the necessary privacy protections. At least two officials involved in the project have resigned. I imagined us creating a smart city of privacy as opposed to a smart city of surveillance. I have to resign because you committed to embedding privacy by design into every aspect of your operation. The fears around Keyside grew in late October 2019 when the Globe and Mail reported on previously unseen documents from Sidewalk Labs which detail how people living in a sidewalk community would interact with and have access to the space around them. This experience largely depends on how much data you're willing to share, and this data could be used to reward or punish people for their behavior. Although the document, known internally as the Yellow Book, was designed as a pitch book for the company and predates Sidewalk's formal agreements with the City of Toronto, it does provide a vision of what the Google sister company would like to do. Specifically, the document details how Sidewalk would require tax and financing authority to finance and provide services, including the ability to impose, capture, and reinvest property taxes. The document also describes reputation-based tools that sound disturbingly similar to the social credit system we have seen in TV shows like Black Mirror and those unfolding in modern China. These tools would lead to a, quote, new currency for community cooperation, effectively establishing a social credit system. Sidewalk could use these tools to, quote, hold people or businesses accountable while rewarding good behavior with easier access to loans and public services. In response to the document leaks, Sidewalk said, quote, the ideas contained in this 2016 internal paper represent the result of a wide-ranging brainstorming process very early in the company's history perhaps due in part to the pushback against privacy invasions, in November 2019, Sidewalk Labs released a 482-page digital innovation appendix stating that none of Keyside's systems will incorporate facial recognition and that Sidewalk Labs won't sell personal information or use it for advertising. 
Sidewalk Labs says it will require explicit consent to share personal information with third parties. In places like San Diego, activists are already fighting against privacy invasions via environmentally friendly smart streetlights that are always listening. In other places like South Korea, the smart city vision is advancing quite quickly. The revolution, embracing the possibilities of super speed 5G mobile internet in a country already one of the world's most digitally connected. We've led the world in developing 5G technology. As phone makers and service providers, we have set the standards, so we can be the first to release such services into the market. For most people in South Korea, it's the fun stuff of 5G that's the big draw. Effortless video chatting with as many friends as you want in any guise you might choose. Real-time video gaming with multiple users and screens. Augmented reality and virtual reality. Even the ability to deliver holograms of your favorite sports or K-pop stars. South Korea's 5G providers are predicting massive uptake, even though only one smartphone maker currently has a device that can handle 5G. We're expecting at least one million of our customers to take up 5G before the end of the year. Then there's the wider possibilities offered by massive data transmission with hardly any delay. The development of smart cars and eventually driverless vehicles. Managing robots in telemedicine or in industry. Our world is likely to look very different. For the moment, future residents of Keyside will have their data protected. But these types of systems are already being put into place in China. Under the expansion of China's Sesame Credit system, more than a million people were denied the right to fly. Chinese citizens live under constant surveillance with CCTVs and facial recognition, a part of daily life. The U.S. is not far behind China. The U.S. government is also expanding their facial recognition capabilities, with the FBI maintaining a massive secret database of face prints. The 5G rollout, the growth of artificial intelligence, and the push towards a smart city future will only increase the potential for abuses of privacy. As we move ever closer to this smart city future, privacy and the liberty that comes with privacy are under extreme threat. A threat to local political control. In September 2018, the FCC passed a new rule putting the federal government in complete control of the 5G rollout. Although the original 1996 Telecommunications Act was the first power grab by the federal government, the September 2018 rule made it so that cities and towns had little ability to regulate or avoid the installation of so-called small cells and additional infrastructure needed for the 5G rollout. Under the new rule, phone companies can be charged no more than $270 to install each small cell antenna. Additionally, local authorities would have 60 days to review the proposed wireless infrastructure. Localities are already limited in deciding where the equipment can be located. The new rule also continued the tradition of forbidding localities from opposing the equipment on health grounds. The only acceptable claim is based on aesthetics. Basically, if you think the tower looks ugly, they'll turn it into a palm tree for you. The Republicans on the FCC stated that limiting the fees that cities can charge localities will free up capital for them to invest in local infrastructure. Democrat Jessica Rosenworcel was the lone dissenter calling the rule, quote, extraordinary federal overreach. I do not believe the law permits Washington to run roughshod over state and local authority like this, and I worry the litigation that follows will only slow our 5G future. Rosenworcel was correct about litigation to follow. In the weeks after the October 2018 rule, two dozen cities and counties filed lawsuits against the Federal Communications Commission. The matter was only made worse when, in April 2019, President Trump issued an executive order about 5G. Local and state bodies must now approve new 5G infrastructure within 90 days. The Trump administration also initiated a cap on the fees local governments can charge telecom companies wanting to install 5G technology. The FCC has also taken action to streamline the permitting process for 5G infrastructure with state and local governments. That's a big deal. Uh, it takes too long to get permits. We're going to free that situation up, and we're going to put limits, and uh, the local areas are going to listen to us very, very strongly. They have a big incentive to do that. 
They must now approve new physical infrastructure within 90 days instead of many years. It can sometimes take three, four, and five years. Uh, we're going to put a limit of 90 days. And there is now a cap on the unreasonable fees local governments often charge. They get greedy. They think, hey, we can really take advantage, and it ends up that everybody gets hurt. So we're putting a cap on those fees. These changes will contribute greatly to building high-speed networks across America, and it's going to happen very quickly, very, very quickly. The pushback against the usurpation of local power by the federal government and the big wireless lobby can be seen clearly in the town of Danville, California. Back in March 2019, the Danville Town Council voted 4-1 to one to block a permit for a 5G small cell installation by Verizon. During the meeting, Danville Mayor Robert Storer stated that the vote was an effort to stand up to the federal government and telecommunications companies like Verizon. The Danville Town Council's decision to deny the land use permit for the small cell opened the town up to possible lawsuits from Verizon. We've lost local control, and this says, you know what, we're sick of this, and we're not going to just sit here and just be bowled over. We say no, we play the cards out, you know, we've been in lawsuits before, we're actually pretty good at it sometimes. I don't want to say it's been shoved down our throats, but it has been. We've lost complete local control, or we're losing so much of it. This, if nothing else, just puts us in a position that says, you know what, we're a little tired of this. If you're going to come to the town of Danville, don't make this room full of people doesn't, that are angry, you know, because our job is to protect the town of Danville. And, you know, we may be spending some money here, and I'm okay with that. I'm actually okay with it because it'll set, it'll set in place how we feel in the town of Danville when what we think is right. Danville City Attorney Robert Ewing reiterated that cities cannot fight the small cells or 5G rollout based on health concerns, stating that, quote, while potential health concerns are a huge concern, if that was the basis on which you were making a decision, I would be fairly confident to tell you that you would lose, because that's about as clear as the law can get. Similar resolutions are passing in towns across the world, either outright banning 5G or requiring more testing before implementation. Between the FCC rules and the presidential executive order, the U.S. federal government is working with the big wireless lobby to force 5G down the throats of cities and states around the country. Together, in an incestuous corporate state relationship, they are slowly taking away choice and consent from local bodies. Most worrisome is the thought that the 5G rollout and the subsequent theft of local power might be setting a precedent for a future where cities and towns have no say in what happens in their own communities and instead are forced to go along with the agenda of the federal government and their corporate buddies. A danger to the environment. The rolling out of 5G might negatively impact our ability to forecast the weather and accurately predict storms. In the spring of 2019, NASA and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, said 5G antennas using similar frequencies used by satellites to gather critical water vapor data could compromise forecasts and science. The FCC and big telecom companies are seeking to expand cellular service into frequency bands such as the one at 24 gigahertz, which falls near the frequency used for forecasting at about 23.8 gigahertz. The FCC, which licenses the wireless spectrum for 5G in the U.S., says the fears are exaggerated. In March 2019, Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross, who oversees NOAA and NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, sent a letter asking the FCC to postpone the auction of the 5G frequency bands. Instead, the FCC went ahead with the auction, selling frequency to both T-Mobile and AT&T. In May 2019, Neil Jacob, acting administrator of NOAA, testified to Congress that an internal study had found 5G-related interference could cost NOAA 77% of the water vapor data it collects at 23.8 gigahertz and could degrade weather forecasts by up to 30%, essentially sending us back to 1980 levels. 5G uses the frequency of 24 gigahertz. Gigahertz is a unit of measurement along this larger electromagnetic spectrum. You know all about this. You're familiar with this. AM radio waves, FM radio waves. There's cell phones and Wi-Fi. You get into the higher wavelengths. You get into things like TV remotes, visible light, medical x-rays, so on and so forth. So you're probably saying at this point, but what does that have to do with the weather, right? We've got these satellites up in orbit around the Earth, and those satellites pick up on different frequencies. Satellites, though, see atmospheric water vapor at 23.8 gigahertz. So if you've got 
that 5G signal emitting out a signal at 24 gigahertz. And then our water vapor is at 23.8 gigahertz. That's really close to each other on that larger spectrum. So if the satellites are looking down to Earth, they're going to get confused. Is it the 5G signal? Is it water vapor? Ultimately, we're not going to be able to determine that. And that data that's used for forecast models is taken right from those satellites. If we can't use that data, those forecasts are going to get worse. Due to their concerns, NASA and NOAA were seeking a sizable buffer zone between the frequency bands used for weather and those used for 5G. This buffer is measured in units of decibel watts. Unfortunately, in late November 2019, at a meeting of the International Telecommunication Union, international regulators agreed to a buffer of 33 decibel watts until September 1, 2027, and a 39 decibel watt limit after that. The goal was to allow 5G companies to start building networks now and to add more protection for weather forecasting once the companies have established their networks. The U.S. has been slow to get into the game, but the president said the FCC would work to make it easier for companies to do so. That includes freeing up high-frequency airwaves or spectrum to carry 5G. And the FCC plans to spend $20 billion over 10 years on expanding 5G broadband for rural communities. Eric Alex, a meteorologist and head of World Meteorological Organization, called the idea of having eight years of lax regulation of grave concern to weather forecasters. Once again, regulators chose policies that benefit big wireless and fail to protect the planet and the people. The 5G expansion not only poses a threat to human health, privacy, and weather forecasting, but an increasing amount of research indicates that surrounding ourselves with an unprecedented amount of digital devices is creating a new form of pollution known as a digital or electro smog. In the report Bees, Birds, and Mankind, German researchers discuss the effects of this electric smog. Quote, the consequences of this development have also been predicted by the critics for many decades and can now no longer be ignored. Bees and other insects disappear, birds avoid certain areas, and are disoriented in other locations. In September 2008, Dr. Ulrich Warnk, one of the authors of that report, also presented his findings to the Radiation Research Trust at the Royal Society in London. He stated that, quote, an unprecedented dense mesh of artificial, magnetic, electrical, and electromagnetic fields are disrupting nature on a massive scale, causing birds and bees to lose their bearings, fail to reproduce, and die. A review of studies from around the world shows that concerns around the electrosmog are rising. One study reviewed the impact of radio frequency radiation from wireless telecommunications on wildlife. The researchers note that phone towers located in the living areas of some species are continuously irradiating wildlife, causing a reduction of their natural defenses, deterioration of their health, and problems in reproduction. The researchers conclude that, quote, microwave and radio frequency pollution constitutes a potential cause for the decline of animal populations and deteriorations of health of plants living near phone masts. To measure these effects, urgent specific studies are necessary. Studies are also beginning to look at the impacts of radio frequency radiation on trees. A 2016 study attempted to verify whether there is a connection between unusual tree damage and radio frequency exposure. The researchers conducted a long-term field monitoring study in two German cities. They observed and took photos of unusual or unexplainable tree damage, along with measurements of electromagnetic radiation. A statistical analysis showed that electromagnetic radiation from cell phone towers is harmful for trees. The researchers note that, quote, these results are consistent with the fact that damage afflicted on trees by mobile phone towers usually starts on one side, extending to the whole tree over time. A 2010 study looked at the decline in aspen trees in Colorado since 2004. This study suggested that the radio frequency exposure may have strong adverse effects on growth rate and may be an underlying factor in aspen decline. Additionally, there are concerns that thousands of trees will be cut down or trimmed to ensure the 5G frequencies operate efficiently. Another area of growing concern relates to the fear that the massive increase in exposure to radio frequency radiation could be one of the causes for bee colony collapse disorder, which has wreaked havoc on the global honeybee population. In a 2017 study, researcher Daniel Favre of Switzerland claims that his article describes an experiment on bees which clearly shows the adverse effects of electromagnetic fields on their behavior. Favre states that, quote, the experiment should be reproduced by other researchers so that the danger of man-made electromagnetism for bees, nature, and thus humans ultimately appears evident to anyone. 
In the study Mobile Phone Mast Effects on Common Frog Tadpoles, researchers exposed eggs and tadpoles to electromagnetic radiation from cell phone antennas for two months, from the egg phase until an advanced phase of tadpole, and found low coordination of movements, an inconsistent growth pattern, and a high mortality rate. The authors conclude, quote, These results indicate that radiation emitted by phone masts in a real situation may affect the development and may cause an increase in mortality of exposed tadpoles. This research may have huge implications for the natural world, which is now exposed to high microwave radiation levels from a multitude of phone masts. Ajit Pai is the chair of the FCC, and he joins me now. Welcome to the News Hour. Thank you for having me on. So I want to ask you about what one of your Democratic colleagues on the FCC had to say about our efforts to get into 5G. She said, so far we've done more harm than good. She cites the president's tariffs on 5G equipment, uh, says the White House has been alienating security allies. We need to expand that network. How do those things hamper your ability to build and grow the network? I respectfully disagree. If you look at some of the independent observers, they believe that the United States is in the lead when it comes to 5G. For example, Cisco recently put out a report suggesting that North America, led of course by the United States, would have twice as many 5G connections as Asia by 2022. That same month, ABI Research said flatly that the United States is in the lead in 5G. Over last week, CTIA pointed out that the United States will have 92 deployments of 5G in the United States by the end of 2019, which is almost twice as many as any country in the world. And just on Tuesday, a report came out that was reported in Bloomberg, pointing out that 5G-related job listings in the United States have increased 12% just over the last three weeks. So these are objective indicia of the fact that we are in the lead in 5G, but we want to maintain that lead, and that's part of the reason why I was at the White House today to announce two new initiatives. Well, deployment is one thing, but consumer... But to those willing to do the homework, it becomes clear. There is ample evidence of negative impacts as a result of radio frequency radiation associated with cell phones, Wi-Fi, and likely 5G. In fact, in 2018, the European Commission's Scientific Committee on Health, Environmental, and Emerging Risks released a statement on emerging health and environmental issues, which clearly outlined the need for more independent research. Under Section 4.4, Potential Effects on Wildlife of Increases in Electromagnetic Radiation, the report states, quote, How exposure to electromagnetic fields could affect humans remains a controversial area, and studies have not yet yielded clear evidence of the impact on mammals, birds, or insects. The lack of clear evidence to inform the development of exposure guidelines to 5G technology leaves open the possibility of unintended biological consequences. These unintended consequences have the potential to affect human life as well as insects, birds, plants, and trees. Chapter 3. The Big Wireless 5G Takeover As I continued my research and began presenting it to city council and fellow Houstonians, I noticed there was often a reluctance to believe what I was claiming. Several times, I was asked something along the lines of, how could something so dangerous be allowed on the market? Doesn't the government regulate this technology? Once again, the trust of the authorities made people feel like they were safe from harm. Unfortunately, the research shows otherwise. But how could this happen? How can the U.S. government allow potentially hazardous products to be sold and used by millions of people? To understand this, we need to go back to 1996. That year, the Telecommunications Act was passed as an effort to update the law around communications technology as the internet was beginning to come into mass public use. The act was also seen as a way to limit the growing AT&T monopoly. Unfortunately, it was the beginning of further consolidation of telecommunications companies and a huge step towards eroding local power. The 1996 Act prohibits local jurisdictions from considering perceived health effects when taking an action on a proposed facility, such as towers or small cells. Instead, cities and towns could only regulate cell sites based on the aesthetics and location of the devices. Quote, No state or local government or instrumentality thereof may regulate the placement, construction, and modification of personal wireless service facilities on the basis of the environmental effects of radio frequency emissions to the extent that such facilities comply with the Commission's regulations concerning such emissions. As long as the facilities comply with the standards set by the FCC, they cannot be subjected to environmental or health regulations. But what happens if those federal standards set by the FCC in 1996 are not adequate? As we will get into shortly, there are studies which show health effects even at the levels allowed by the 1996 Telecommunications Act, not to mention the fact that the standards are over two decades old and based on outdated technology. 
Not only was the Telecom Act designed to protect the profits of the big wireless companies, but somewhere along the way, the FCC and the telecoms developed an incestuous relationship that has overtaken the voices and concerns of the American people. In 2015, the Harvard Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics published an expose by investigative journalist Norm Ouster on the financial ties between the U.S. FCC and how, as a result, the wireless industry has bought unfettered access to and power over a major U.S. regulatory agency. The report details how the FCC, an independent government agency created in 1934 to regulate interstate communications by radio, TV, wire, satellite, and cable, has become a captured agency with big wireless leaders filling the government seats in a revolving door fashion. Regarding the passing of the 1996 Telecom Act, Alster writes that, quote, Late lobbying won the wireless industry enormous concessions from lawmakers, many of them major recipients of industry hard and soft dollar contributions. Congressional staffers who helped lobbyists write the new law did not go unrewarded. 13 of 15 staffers later became lobbyists themselves. Alster states that direct lobbying by industry is just one of many worms in a rotting apple. The report says the FCC is involved in a network of powerful moneyed interests with limitless access and a variety of ways to shape policy. Alster believes the worst part is that the wireless industry has been allowed to grow unchecked and virtually unregulated with fundamental questions on public health routinely ignored. Unfortunately, the situation goes beyond corrupt government agencies and into actually defaming those who speak out against potential harms caused by wireless technology. During the 1990s, biochemist Jerry Phillips was hired by cell phone giant Motorola to study the effects of the radio frequency radiation emitted by cell phones. Phillips and his colleagues looked at the effects of different radio frequency signals on rats and on cells in a dish. Phillips says the relationship between him and his employer was initially cordial, but soured once he submitted research data to Motorola, which found harmful effects to the DNA structure as a result of exposure to radio frequency radiation. The negative results were not to Motorola's liking, and they began putting pressure on him. These folks were very, very upset and began to talk about how are they going to handle this, what sort of spin can we put on this? What can we expect from this? And from that point on, the relationship changed. What we saw was that Motorola began to exert more and more control over the work, telling us what to do, telling us how to write abstracts, what to say in the abstracts, what to say in the papers. Um, I said, how to do the work? No, don't do this. Yes, do it this way. This was unacceptable. I had completed our study of DNA damage and I submitted the final report to Motorola and I got a call from Mays Swicord at Motorola. Now Mays is the former head of the Center for what is it? CDRA, Center for Devices and Radiological Health at the FDA and he left the FDA and went to work for Motorola. Keep that connection in mind. That's interesting. He also handpicked his successor at the FDA and tried to urge me not to publish the study. They didn't tell me not to. They just said, no, this isn't ready for publication. And they wanted me to do more work. I stopped taking calls from them, and I went ahead and published the study. Uh, it came out in 1998, and I wanted nothing more to do with any Motorola-related work. I, I wasn't going to put up with that kind of control. I wouldn't put up with that attitude. That was it. I, I think one has to exercise caution at this point. And what makes the cellular telephone research area so difficult right now is there is no money available for research other than that that's coming from industry. So I mean, what, is, what does this do? I don't have any faith in what comes out. I have absolutely none, not with my dealings with industry so far. In another example of industry attempting to influence research, we have Dr. Henry Lai of the University of Washington and fellow researcher Narendra Singh. The researchers were looking at the effects of non-ionizing radiation, the same type of radiation emitted by cell phones, on the DNA of rats. They used a level of radiation considered safe by FCC standards and found that the DNA in the brain cells of the rats was damaged or broken by exposure to radiation. After publishing the research in 1995, Dr. Lai would later learn of a full-scale effort to discredit the experiments. Lai and Singh caused controversy when they publicly complained about the restrictions placed on their research by their funders, the Wireless Technology Research Program. 
In response to this public action, the head of the wireless technology research sent a memo asking the University of Washington President Richard McCormick to fire Lai and Singh. McCormick refused, but the message was clear. Get rid of anyone who makes our products look bad. In a leaked internal Motorola memo, executives claimed to have succeeded in wargaming the Lai Singh experiments. This shocked me, Lai says. The letter trying to discredit me, the War Games memo, As a scientist doing research, I was not expecting to be involved in a political situation. It opened my eyes on how games are played in the world of business. You don't bite the hand that feeds you. The pressure is very impressive. Think about that for a moment. An international corporation trying to exert pressure on scientists who draw conclusions that their product is causing harm to human health. Even further, Dr. Lai's experiments show negative health consequences at levels considered safe by the FCC. The captured agency report makes it clear that this type of corruption takes place because of the, quote, free flow of executive leadership between the FCC and the industries it presumably oversees. For example, at the time of the report's release, the chairman of the FCC was Tom Wheeler, a man with deep ties to the big wireless industry. In 2013, Wheeler was nominated as FCC chairman by Obama after raising more than $700,000 for Obama's presidential campaigns. And that's because for more than 30 years... Uh, Tom's been at the forefront of some of the very dramatic changes that we've seen in the way we communicate and how we live our lives. Wheeler led the two most powerful industry lobbying groups, the National Cable and Telecommunications Association and the Cellular Telecommunications and Internet Association, or the CTIA. The current chairman of the FCC could also be seen as another example of a captured agency in action. Ajit Pai, a lawyer and current chairman of the FCC, served as associate general counsel at Verizon Communications between 2001 and 2003, where he handled competition and regulatory matters. Pai was appointed to the FCC by Barack Obama in 2012 and then made FCC chairman by Donald Trump in January 2017. In collusion, uh, I mean, Uh, many people are still shell-shocked that I'm up here tonight. Uh, they ask themselves, how on earth did this happen? Well, uh, moments before tonight's dinner, somebody leaked a 14-year-old video that helps answer that question. And in all candor, I can no longer hide from the truth. And so I might as well own it. Uh, let's take a look. <laughs> FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr is another example of a government official working closely with industry and maintaining relationships which clearly present conflicts of interest. We're very excited about the build-out of 5G and next-gen internet infrastructure. Carr is credited with accelerating the 5G build-out. Prior to joining the FCC, Carr worked as an attorney at Wiley Ryan, where his clients were Verizon, AT&T, CenturyLink, CTIA, the Wireless Association, and the USTA, the telecom lobby. 
The Wiley Ryan Law Firm is a hotbed of activity for former government officials and industry regulars. One of the founders of the law firm is Richard Wiley, himself a former FCC chairman. On September 30th, 2019, Commissioner Carr and other officials were in Houston to discuss the future of 5G. How do you respond to those communities around the country who are fighting based on property rights or just different, you know, pushback? How, what's the, I guess, the FCC position on that? We're very excited about the build out of 5G and next gen internet infrastructure. And at the FCC, we've been really building on a lot of the policies that state and local leaders have been putting in place to make sure that every single community can benefit. It's really a great job story. It's a great story for economic growth. So we're really happy with the progress that we're seeing in building out 5G, both here in Houston and a lot of other communities around the country. What about those who have concerns, uh, say, for example, Harvard that put out the study about captured agency that folks like yourself who've been lawyers and worked in the industry are essentially captured the, the regulators? You know, this idea that the FCC can't be trusted to regulate 5G and cell phones and things of that sort because of not only yours, but Ajit Pai and others' uh, industry connections. Yeah, we're really glad to see the growth in 5G. And one of the things that we've done at the FCC is build on the policies put in place in, by local elected feeders elected leaders here in Houston, Texas, the state legislator put policies in place that help guide the way for 5G builds. So we're really excited with the progress that we're seeing by really taking the lead of so many of these local elected officials. No comment on the conflict of interest concerns? Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Good to talk to you. The following day, I was able to question Commissioner Carr for a second time, and once again, he avoided my questions. Mr. Carr, can I follow up with you on yesterday? Uh, I'm good, man. Thank you. All right, well, then we'll just do it this way. All right, so look, you have ties to the industry. We'll just be more blunt this time since trying nice doesn't seem to work with you guys. So you have ties to the industry. Thanks, man. You omitted right those facts. This is not press. You're a public per- servant. You're walking the streets. Um, so you've been with the FCC. You've worked with, a law, with a, a law firm that defended the CTI, the people who organized this whole thing. The CTI gave the mayor the 5G wireless champion award. I mean, essentially, this whole thing was just a big industry. There's not a single mention of lawsuits on the state level, on the federal level. I'm sure you're aware that there are cities in Texas that are suing right now because those are the stakeholders that are being ignored. They're not, you know, the surveillance concerns are being ignored. You guys talk about all these sensors, all these great things, but not a single person mentioned that there are privacy concerns, there are health concerns that I know you're aware. The FCC recently announced that they're even going to reevaluate cell phones because the Chicago Tribune study showed that iPhones are putting off 200 times the radiation that you guys allow and say is safe. I mean, realistically, you can't even comment on that. Thanks, man. It's really good to see you again. Thanks for showing up the event. Appreciate it. Of course I'm here. But, I mean, I'm just saying people see you respond like this, and it doesn't even seem like human. It just You can't even, like, acknowledge or say a simple statement. But I guess that's what we should expect from the federal government. Much of this revolving door relationship between industry and government can be traced to the CTIA the Cellular, Telecommunications, and Internet Association. Established in 1984, the CTIA claims to represent the U.S. wireless communications industry from carriers and equipment manufacturers. The CTIA, quote, advocates for legislative and regulatory policies at federal, state, and local levels that foster the continued innovation, investment, and increasing economic impact of America's wireless industry, CTIA is active on a wide range of issues, including spectrum policy, wireless infrastructure, and the Internet of Things, among others. They also host events on topics ranging from cybersecurity to 5G. The CTIA's board of directors includes the presidents, CEOs, and other senior officials of Verizon, Sprint, T-Mobile, Nokia, Ericsson, Intel, General Motors, TrackPhone, Easy Texting, and others. The CTIA's current president and CEO is Meredith Atwell Baker. Baker has spent the last two decades bouncing between lobbying for big wireless and working for the government. From 1998 to 2000, Baker worked as director of congressional affairs at the CTIA. Afterwards, she worked for the U.S. government as an FCC commissioner between July 2009 to June 2011. She then went back to the CTIA, where she is now president and CEO in charge of promoting the so-called Race to 5G. So what exactly is the race to 5G? If you've paid attention to any media or visit a cell phone store recently, you've likely heard of the buzz about 5G, and more specifically, the race to 5G. Geopolitically speaking, the race to 5G describes the ongoing rift between the US and China, 
a kind of digital Cold War where the two superpowers race to implement the next generation of cellular technology because of its potential for massive profit and massive data collection. The American media and President Trump have stated that Chinese company Huawei could use their 5G infrastructure to spy on Americans. Trump has called on federal officials and American companies to abandon Huawei equipment. This fear of Chinese spying using 5G equipment completely ignores the reality that the U.S. government has the same exact opportunity to pressure American companies to spy on the private data of Americans. The race to 5G could also be described as a clever marketing concept designed to sell consumers an upgrade they did not know they wanted or needed. Not to mention an upgrade that has sparked lawsuits and has many health and privacy concerns. As part of the ongoing race to 5G, telecom companies are promoting 5G as the solution for faster downloads and high-definition movie streaming. It's not immediately clear if the public is demanding faster downloads, but the telecoms, global governments, and the tech industry are pushing the shift towards 5G. While it is true that 5G has the potential to spur on innovation in the fields of medicine, manufacturing, entertainment, and other industries, there has not been a truly organic call for this emerging technology. It seems much of the hype around the 5G rollout is coming from the CTIA itself. Yes, the Cellular Telecommunications and Internet Association, the organization created to lobby explicitly for the wireless industry. The CTIA is big wireless. 5G is a race, and we must win. The sheer power of innovation in the U.S., will come up with new types of services and applications that will ride on top of those networks. Mobile 5G, big opportunity. Video IoT and a competition among cities to bring smart city to life. I think 5G is the biggest and most important evolutionary step in the history of wireless. We know the best path to ensuring 5G One of the ways the CTIA has spread enthusiasm for the race to 5G is by working with city officials. The CTIA has been honoring city mayors who have worked to erode local authority regarding the 5G rollout. Thank you, Derek. Thank you very much. The 5G Wireless Champion Awards honor the state and local officials who, quote, bring next-generation 5G networks into communities and remove barriers to the deployment of next-generation wireless infrastructure. In 2018, the CTIA gave out three 5G Wireless Champion Awards to mayors across the United States, including... Houston's Mayor Sylvester Turner. I think you're always assessing, you know, the pros and the cons, but I haven't seen anything that would cause us to slow down. As I mentioned earlier, it was the mayor's response to my questions about 5G which encouraged me to look deeper. I found out that in July 2018, Mayor Turner stood side by side with Verizon Wireless officials to announce plans to roll out 5G technology in Houston. The mayor said 5G will turn Houston into a smart city with better control of traffic flow, money-saving smart streetlights, and driverless cars. By September 2018, Turner was awarded the 5G Wireless Champion Award by the CTIA. The CTIA stated, quote, Under Mayor Turner's leadership, Houston has streamlined the permitting process by not requiring a license or attachment agreement for new poles or small cells and completes review ahead of deadlines. Despite my efforts at emailing the mayor and city council about the concerns and visiting city council many times, I continued to be met with silence. When I decided to run for mayor, making 5G a central part of my campaign, I finally had the opportunity to call out the mayor to his face and in front of the people of Houston. I think I'm probably the person who knows the most about smart grids and 5G on the stage. Go ahead and anything you your favorite search engine, search Derek Bros 5G, you'll find it. Here's where the videos are. Go on to city council, confronting this council member and this mayor about the privacy concerns, about the health concerns, about the loss of local power concerns. The mayor can sit here and say that they're giving a voice, but the fact of the matter is that last summer, the mayor was given the 5G Wireless Champion Award by the telecom lobby, specifically for removing regulations and restrictions. Go look at the press release and rolling this forward. I've been there going to city council over and over. The mayor's literally ran away from me three times asking questions about this. He can sit up here on stage and actually like cares about your privacy. I've actually interviewed attorneys with the American Civil Liberties Union who said that 5G Sylvester Turner and mayors like him are a problem, but they are a symptom of a bigger battle. The CTIA uses the 5G Wireless Champion Awards and other local programs 
to convince mayors and local officials to support the 5G agenda. This allows the agenda adopted by the federal government and Big Wireless to be filtered down to the state and local level. Now to another first for the city of Houston. We first told you about this last week. Our city is going to be among the first in the country to experience 5G wireless technology. Verizon announcing that it is going to begin rolling out a residential network before the end of the year and then a mobile version next year. It's going to change how some people use their phones, but the impact stretches well beyond handheld devices to transportation, health care, and entertainment. Despite a number of lawsuits from cities and states, objections from scientists and health professionals, concerns from citizens, politicians, and journalists, the CTIA, the FCC, and Donald Trump continue to push the 5G agenda forward. As I discovered in my research, there are health and privacy concerns around cell phones, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, laptops, and other digital devices. The research shows we should limit our exposure to these devices and find ways to protect our privacy. We should also recognize that the major difference between the 5G smart grid and the current technology is that once 5G rolls out, you will not be able to avoid it. You can choose not to use a cell phone or not install Wi-Fi in your home, but once the 5G network is complete, you will be surrounded by hundreds of thousands of sensors, small cells, and other infrastructure. Once I understood the implications of this, I realized I had to know what I can do to protect myself, my family, and my friends. Chapter 4. Solutions The reality is that we are already living in the electro-digital smog. The public has excitedly purchased the latest upgrades to their digital technology of choice, from smartphones to laptops, doorbell cameras, public Wi-Fi networks, home assistants, smart houses, and the early stages of 5G, we are inundated with digital technology which emit various levels of radio frequency radiation. Bit by bit, device by device, we are being exposed to an increasing level of radiation and this cumulative effect has the potential to cause a great amount of harm to the public. Collectively, each of these devices form a digital panopticon where private companies, law enforcement, governments, and hackers can literally trace your movements from the moment you wake up and interact with your phone throughout your entire day as you move through public spaces and visit your work, family, and friends. If the public doesn't wake up to these dangers and quickly organize a massive global effort to push back against 5G, the smart city future seems inevitable. So what would this pushback look like, and what can we do as individuals? First, the opposition would need to involve ending the relationship between big wireless execs and government officials, as well as an honest discussion about the established dangers posed by our digital world. Organizing political opposition should take place at all levels, but I highly encourage everyone to start getting involved in their local communities and asking about the dangers presented in this documentary. You can join a local group that might be talking about 5G, privacy, health, or the environment, and let them know about these concerns. If there isn't a group already, you can start one. Pass out flyers at community festivals, farmers markets, concerts, and political events. You can host educational events at community centers and show this documentary. If your neighborhood has a homeowners association or similar group, you can attempt to fight against the installation of new small cells in your neighborhood. Some activists and concerned homeowners have even filed lawsuits in an attempt to stop the 5G rollout. When it comes to solutions for protecting yourself in the meantime, Remember that the National Toxicology Program's 10-year study recommends those concerned about the potential health risks from radiofrequency radiation should, quote, use speaker mode or headset or reduce the amount of time spent using your cell phone. Simply put, limiting your use of and exposure to these devices is the best solution available. I would recommend turning your phone on airplane mode when not using it or simply turning it off when not in use. I know, it's a scary thought, but we will survive. I would also stop using Bluetooth headphones and stop using Bluetooth while driving in your vehicle. There are also companies producing devices which are supposed to be able to block or absorb the EMFs emitted by our devices. Do your research and see what works for you. Probably one of the most important steps to take is to stop falling asleep with your phone or next to your laptop. I also started unplugging my Wi-Fi at night to protect myself from unnecessary exposure while I'm sleeping. The exposure to these devices and the radio frequency radiation they emit has the potential to disturb your sleep and create stress. This can cause an overall decline in the body's ability to heal and repair at night. When it comes to your home or office, I recommend rewiring as much as possible using Ethernet cables for your desktop or laptop. This will allow you to remove Wi-Fi if you choose and drastically decrease your exposure. There are even options available to use Ethernet connections on your cell phone. There are also similar concerns regarding the smart meters which have been rolled out around the U.S. 
do some research, and find out if you can opt out of a smart meter in favor of an analog meter. Remember what I said about the difference between 5G and previous technologies? Once it's rolled out, you will not be able to avoid it while in public. No matter what you do in your house or with your own phone, if 5G is everywhere, there will be no way to opt out. I have seen researchers working on devices that could protect you in public by either repelling or absorbing the EMFs, and others have suggested clothing that can defend you, but for the moment, none of these seem adequate to protect you from the coming 5G smart grid. So after spending the last year diving deep into this topic, interviewing experts, and networking with other researchers, I have no doubt that 5G is being promoted under false pretenses. We won the race in 4G, and that's why all the innovation happens here in the United States. We've got 30 trials here in the United States, but China's got 100 trials going on this year. Uh, Japan and Korea are really racing to get it done for their Olympic commitments. Just like the Greeks bearing false gifts to the people of Troy, government officials and the big wireless industry are promising the people that 5G is a gift too good to pass up. As we have shown, there are numerous valid reasons to oppose the 5G rollout. Whether it's concerns about health, privacy, local power, or the environment, the government and the wireless industry need to answer our questions. Another thing, where has the media been during all of this? If I could dig up this information and gather these sources with my limited skills and time, why didn't the corporate media identify and report on the concerns about 5G? Thanks again for having me. Why did the New York Times and other compliant media outlets insinuate that opponents of 5G are simply victims of Russian disinformation? Instead of listening to the researchers speaking up and the people pushing back, the media stood silent. So all this begs the question, would consumers be so quick to embrace cell phones, Wi-Fi, and 5G if the wireless industry and their partners in government hadn't silenced critics and corrupted the science? If the public knew this information, would that change their minds? Does it change yours? The cold hard truth is that we have willingly accepted this technology. Yes, we have been lied to by the people we thought we could trust, but at the end of the day, the power is in our hands. We get to decide whether we surround ourselves with devices that threaten our privacy and our health. We must take responsibility for our own actions and remember to be skeptical of promises of convenience and utopia. As the saying goes, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Thank you for watching.